Um, well, let me, while I'm figuring out how to get my screen connected. Um, awesome. Uh, all right, sorry. <laughs> And you are able to just see my slide right now, correct? Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so as um, they were saying, my name is Erin Kane. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Boston University. Um, and I am thrilled to have been invited to speak to everybody this morning. Um, or morning for me, evening perhaps where you are. Um, but I'm really excited to talk to you today about um, some of my postdoctoral work that I've been doing, um, trying to understand the ways that orangutans in Gunung Palung National Park develop ecological competence. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet, um, but my email and also my Twitter handle are on this first slide. Um, if you want to, um, if you have any questions or comments or um, I don't know, want to see more cute orangutan baby photos. So when we think about life histories, um, sort of the ways that animals um, grow and develop and kind of spend their energy over the course of their lives, we typically divide life history strategies into two big categories. So animals with a fast life history are those animals, um, you know, like cats or like rats or rabbits, animals that reproduce early, that have many offspring at a time, and in general, they don't live particularly long. Um, and we can uh, contrast this with animals that have a slow life history. Um, so those are going to be animals um, who take a very long time to reproduce. So they have a kind of an extended reproductive period compared to something like a cat that can have babies about every six months if it really wants to. Um, they tend to have one offspring at a time as opposed to a litter and they live really long lives. Um, so what this means is they're throughout their development um, there's lots of opportunities for, for learning and they have this long period of growth and development. When we think about um, the mammals in general, um, primates tend to have, you know, among the most extended life histories and really long developmental period. And we see this across all different taxa of primates, right? Um, most babies take at least a couple of years to mature. It's rare for primates to be born um, with more than, really with more than one baby, but occasionally with more than two. And we see a really, really extended development period. In some cases for, for your humans, you know, that development extends for like 20 years. Um, but in general, comparing, you know, a monkey to a rat, um, it, it's really clear that we have a, an extended life history and this long period of development. So sometimes when we think about why primates have this really extended life history, um, we think about it as sort of a, a consequence or a, a, a function or an adaptation to the complex social systems that characterize lots of primates. So if you are a Japanese macaque in a group with 35 other animals, you need to, you know, figure out where you as a baby macaque fit into this dominance hierarchy and, you know, who's more dominant to your mother and does that mean, you know, how do they relate to you and who do you play with and who do you avoid, you know, who grooms you, who do you groom. And so we'll sometimes see these complex social systems pointed to as a driver for this extended development because it takes a long time to figure out what to do in such a complicated social environment. Now, if we look at the, the primates in general, orangutans have the longest, most extended life history of any primate. They have a really long interbirth interval, so between six and eight, six and eight years between babies. Um, and what that means for orangutans, they have a really long childhood. They could have as many as eight years being their mother's only offspring, getting her sort of undivided attention. They also have a pretty late age at sexual maturity, so somewhere between 11 and 15. Um, they have this really long period to, to turn into an adult orangutan. Um, 
but orangutans are semi-solitary, right? They're not living in a social system with 35 other animals that they're interacting with on a daily basis. And when I say, um, you know, so I know a lot of you are studying monkeys, maybe macaques, and you're used to these really active, um, you know, there's fights and there's the plants and there's all sorts of stuff going on all the time. Um, when I say that orangutans are semi-solitary, we call it a party or an encounter when two orangutans pass within about 50 meters of each other in the forest. So they really don't spend a lot of time interacting with each other. I don't mean this to say that orangutans are not socially complex. Um, orangutans actually have a really interesting um, kind of maturation um, for adult males in particular. So you have two different ways to be an adult male orangutan. You can be a flanged male like this guy on the right, um, or you can be an unflanged male. You don't develop those big fatty cheek pads. These two males have really different reproductive strategies. They have really different ways of interacting with females. Females and their offspring move through the forest together. There's some suggestion that there might be infanticide risk. We've seen babies disappear. Um, so I don't mean this to say that orangutans are not socially complex, but the question is, you know, is this the sort of social complexity that would drive that really extended childhood? And if we think about it, are there other things that might explain why orangutans have such a long life history? Well, let me take you to the forests of Indonesian Borneo. So the forests in Indonesian Borneo are characterized by what we call mast fruiting. So these forests are dominated by one particular family of trees called dipterocarps. And dipterocarps have this really unique way of producing fruit. Um, so basically what happens is the majority of the trees in the forest that are these dipterocarps produce fruit every two to 10 years pretty regularly. There's no real predictable pattern. Um, and so what happens is for like four months, 90% of the trees in the forest produce fruit. And then for the next three and a half years, there's no fruit in the forest. And then all of a sudden, every tree in the forest will produce fruit. And then there isn't any fruit in the forest. There's some relationship here probably between um, El Nino events and these mass fruiting events. Um, but the relationship is complicated to the extent that it's taken scientists a long time to sort of tease apart these dynamics. You can imagine for an orangutan, this is even more complicated. Um, so what it means, so we see the, this dramatic variation in fruit availability. And these are um, figures from a couple of papers about this sort of variation in fruit um, productivity. And you can see on the right, this is there's a peak in March of 1987. Then there's some fluctuation fruit availability. There's a peak four years later. So in the interim four years, the trees just are not producing fruit. As you might suspect, orangutan's diets shift really dramatically in response to these changes in fruit productivity. Um, so these graphs, the bottom axis, the horizontal axis for all of them is the percent of trees in the forest that are fruiting. Um, and on the uh, left axis, the, the vertical axis is the amount of or the proportion of kilocalories that that food type contributes to the diet. And the general message here is that orangutans eat lots and lots of fruit when it's available. And when it's available, they really decrease their consumption of things like leaves and bark and pith and insects. But when it isn't available, most of what orangutans eat are leaves and bark and pith and insects. A lot of those insects are termites, so they're breaking apart termite mounds up in trees. Um, what this means is that we see really dramatic differences in dietary quality as well. Um, so when it's a, you know, a really productive period in the forest, the orangs are eating these lovely, soft, squishy, you know, fleshy, carbohydrate-rich fruits. They're eating things like durian and rambutan. Um, it's a real bonanza. Um, and this is perhaps my favorite picture I've ever taken of a wild primate. Um, so this is Walima. If you look carefully, you can see she's got four fruits in her mouth. She's also got a fruit in each foot. Um, so when <laughs> there's fruit available, the orangutans go crazy and their, their um, caloric intake increases really, really dramatically. So they're eating, you know, thousands of calories. 
On the other hand, when it's not a period of mass productivity, uh, most of what they're eating is those leaves and bark and pith and unripe fruit, termites, things like that. Um, they're not nearly as easy to digest, right? So they're not these soft, squishy, carbohydrate-rich foods that break down really easily. Um, and they also can take some degree of dexterity and force to actually eat, right? You have to strip the bark, you have to break open the termite mound. Um, so, you know, this orangutan is eating pith from the inside of a palm, you have to rip it out. Basically, the message is that the, the changes in fruit availability are really tied to changes in um, diet quality. So what's the relationship between orangutan life history and masts? Well, we know orangutans take a really long time to grow and develop, right? And we know that orangutans live in these highly unpredictable habitats. And this starts to sound like something called an ecological risk aversion hypothesis that was developed by Charles Jansen and Carol Van Shake back in the early 90s. But basically what they said is we recognize that large bodied animals have a pretty low predator risk. And this is true for orangutans. On Sumatra, there are tigers. Um, orangutans tend to be up in the canopy, so tigers don't really bother them much. On Borneo, there are no tigers. The only animal that like theoretically could predate on an orangutan is um, um, land sun bears, and they're pretty small. It would take a lot of work for a sun bear to eat an orangutan. So we can take for granted that orangutans have a pretty low predation risk. Um, the ecological risk aversion hypothesis also says in an unpredictable environment, large bodied animals risk starvation if they grow and develop too quickly. So if you are a baby orangutan and there's a mast and you eat lots and lots of fruit and you get really, really big and then there's no more fruit productivity, you're probably not going to be able to take in enough calories to sustain that rate of growth and development and you might starve to death. So what they proposed is that large bodied animals extend their growth and development to mitigate the risk of starvation. So that would mean for orangutans, they grow slowly enough that their growth and development period, first of all, encompasses a couple of different periods where there's lots of fruit in the environment. And second of all, it gives them enough time to go from being small to being large. They can build up their fat stores. They can you know, protect their body quality and things like that, right? So, so having this extended period of growth and development lets them prevent or lets them protect against starvation when there is not as much fruit available. So this seems like a pretty sensible hypothesis to explain whether or not, or, or you know, to explain the sort of extended life history in orangutans. So we want to actually examine the question, is this life history an ecologically risk-averse strategy for orangutans? So to answer these questions, I work with the Gunung Palung Orangutan Project. Um, this project was founded in the mid-90s by my supervisor, Dr. Cheryl Knott, who's in the forest in that upper right-hand picture. Um, and none of the research that I'm about to tell you about would be possible without our amazing team in the field. Um, so we have a number of Indonesian um, collaborators. We work um, closely with Indonesian scientists and researchers in government and university jobs. Um, we have long-term employees who are out in the forest every day following orangutans and taking really detailed data from you know four in the morning until the orangs go to bed and we have a team of indonesian and american and international students and grad students and researchers who pull all of this long-term data together and have been since the mid 90s so Gunung Palung National Park, as I've said, is located in Indonesia. So it's on the island of Borneo, in Indonesian Borneo, which is called Kalimantan. So you can see it here in this little orange box. Um, and Gunung Palung National Park is a beautiful, beautiful place to work. Um, our field station is located um, kind of in a, at a, a valley right before so basically Gunung means mountain in, in Bahasa Indonesia. So there, there are two mountains in the park and our field station is located right where the mountains start, um, the elevation starts. Um, it's a, a primary rainforest 
Um, it's characterized by pretty intense ecological diversity. So there are seven distinct habitats within our main study area, um, distinguished by you know, different trees and different kind of geological formations and things like that. The park has been protected in some form since the 30s, um, and it has a pretty complex history of, of land use, um, especially around the sort of the borders of the park where there are villages. Um, so there have been, you know, some incursions, especially deforestation throughout the border zone, um, some selective logging um, and some forest fires, but really the, the core where we do most of our research is essentially untouched primary rain rainforest, and it's it's a, an amazing place to work. Um, the orangutans um, have been under consistent observation since 1994. So we individually recognize a number of individuals. And because it's been such a long-term project, there are actually some individuals that we've followed since birth or we've known since before they were born, um, who are now adults who are growing up and having their own offspring. Um, so it's a it's a really exciting place to do research. And because it's characterized by these dramatic fluctuations in fruit availability, it's a great place to ask questions about how juveniles cope with these fluctuations in fruit availability. So the first question that we want to understand is whether or not orangutans really do have a harder time with these low periods of fruit availability than adults do. Do they need to be ecologically diverse or are they doing okay? Um, you know, eating pith and bark and termite mounds and things like that. So there are some reasons to suspect that a young orangutans are going to be having a harder time coping with these periods of low fruit availability than adults. Um, the first reason to suggest this just comes from looking at their actual morphology. Um, so adult orangutans have really um, well-developed anatomy for eating mechanically challenging foods. They have jaws and teeth that are really well adapted for sort of repetitive loading. So if we're eating tough foods, for eating hard foods, they have extremely thick enamel. And basically the way that their, the adult anatomy is, um, has evolved is such that they, ha they have really resistant, th their incisors and their molars are really good at handling these intense forces while they're chewing and processing kind of difficult to eat foods. Um, so this really does suggest that at least occasionally orangutans have to cope with foods that offer significant mechanical challenges while they're eating them. We also see, you know, there's sexual dimorphism, but more than just sexual dimorphism, we see real changes in growth and development throughout ontogeny and changes in size. It sounds kind of obvious to say, but, um, you know, as a small orangutan, um, you're less powerful, your jaws are less powerful, your teeth are smaller and less resistant. Um, you have a smaller gape, so you can open your mouth kind of just a, a lesser amount than adults. And that's going to be um, kind of a limit on how much force you can exert on foods and how well you can chew things and you know, how, much you can, how much you can actually grip with your teeth and how much pressure you can put on foods. So in terms of um, ontogeny and morphology, there, there are some good reasons to hypothesize that juveniles are going to be worse than adults at coping with foods that might be mechanically protect, protected. So the first, the way that I started to ask this question was actually looking at video data of orangutans chewing. So I'm just reporting kind of a subset of our video data. Analysis is ongoing. I have an army of undergrads who are watching our videos of orangutans feeding for me, but these are videos that I coded myself. Um, so it's about 320 minutes, about 240 videos collected between 2014 and 2015. These videos were all collected during feeding bouts. So one of the things that we do while we're collecting these, you know, full day follows of orangutans is we want to understand um, exactly how they're processing foods. We want to see, because we want to calculate sort of their nutritional intake, we want to see how much food they're eating per minute, right? So these videos were mostly collected to calculate feeding rates and also to help with individual identification. Um, and so what the videos calculate or captured was actually a subset of a feeding bout. Um, and from these videos, I was able to calculate an ingestive rate um, for 573 food items. I also calculated the ways that orang or 
kind of recorded the ways that orangutans process food. So this is Prabhu, one of our adult males, and he is eating a delicious, soft, fleshy, squishy, sugar-rich fruit. Um, so you get kind of a sense of what these videos look like. Here's a baby also chewing on something. So when I was recording um, data from these videos, I recorded the frequency that orangutans introduced food to the mouth. So basically every individual bite that they put in their mouth. And then the frequency that each tooth type was used to process foods. Um, so thinking about the number of times they chew with their incisors for each um, time they put a piece of food in their mouth, the number of times they chew with their molars for each time they put food in their mouth. And as you can see from these little gifs, the distinction between different tooth types gets a little bit complicated. Um, so what I ended up calculating and what I'll present mostly here is looking just at sort of all oral processing relative to kind of the overall, um, or all oral processing for each time they put food in their mouth. And I should say, this is some work that I started doing with my PhD supervisor, Scott McGraw. So he's done a lot of work looking at oral processing um, of some monkeys in, in the Ivory Coast, but I, it was exciting to be able to, to use those methods to look at the ways that orangutans are chewing their foods. Um, so I made sure that my intra observer error for how I was coding all of these videos um, was less than 5%. Um, and I wanted to see how orangutans are processing foods. So my caveat here is that I'm not really going to present any statistical tests because I have really unequal sample sizes and not large samples for the juveniles. But what we can say pretty conclusively from this data is that compared to adults, juveniles eat things in a weird way. They process foods oddly. So on average, adult males tend to chew their food somewhere between two and five actual chewing cycles, um, either in terms of chewing with the incisors or chewing with the molars each time they put food in their mouth. And that's pretty consistent whether they're eating fruit, termites, leaves, or bark. Adult females also, so there's a little bit more variation. They chew foods overall somewhere between two and eight times each time they put a piece of food in their mouth. Um, but it's still pretty consistent. Um, and so we can see that leaves take a little bit more oral processing than the other foods that they're eating. Um, but they're really, you know, they don't seem to be in terms of the actual number of chews. They're not chewing all that much. Juveniles are much more variable in the amount of chewing that they do. Um, so my caveat here is that I don't have a huge sample size for juveniles. Um, but you know, what they do is, is pretty variable and it's not clear all of the time that the video that we have is them actually eating. Sometimes they put food in their mouth and they're just like chomping on a twig. Um, they're not necessarily processing that twig. Um, but, you know, what we can say pretty conclusively um, is that they're doing things differently than adults are, right? Juveniles and adults are processing foods pretty differently. Um, and I think it's, it's fair to say that juveniles are less efficiently processing foods than adults. They're using more chews. They're taking, they're a lot more variable while they're eating foods. Of course, um, what this can't tell us is how much force goes into each bite. I can't really tell us because of the, the limitations of my sample size right now. I can't compare across, you know, the same species or something like that. Um, but as far as sort of a, a first stab at understanding whether these different times of, of variable fruit availability or of low fruit availability in particular exert particular challenges for juveniles, I think the answer is probably yes. Juveniles do less well than adults at processing these sort of complicated foods. Um, so remember, this is especially salient because of that high variability in fruit availability. Um, and so if, it, if it's challenging to eat food for, you know, three years and then you're punctuated, you know, by these two mass periods, that's going to be pretty dramatic. That's going to be a serious constraint on your ability to take in calories and grow and develop. Um, 
And just to remind you what the foods look like while they're eating preferred and non-preferred foods are these foods that are, you know, when, when ripe fruit is available versus non-ripe fruit, most of the time baby orangutans are having to figure out how you go about eating bark or how you go about eating pith. Um, so kind of a corollary to this, in general, the great apes nurse for a really long time um, compared to other primates, right? So there's this relationship between the amount of milk that um, primates take in um, and their energy needs as they grow and develop. And then they, so basically during early periods of development, orangut or babies can nurse enough to support their energetic needs. And then as they start to get bigger, their mother's um, lactation isn't, you know, doesn't provide enough caloric energy to support them and they start incorporating solid food. So for orangutans or great apes in general, we see that they reach this period where they are, they need to take in more energy um, than their mother's milk is providing, but they can't eat enough solid food to provide that energy. So there's this period where milk is actually not providing all of their, buff, uh, all of their energetic needs, but it's acting as a buffer while they're starting to incorporate solid foods. And what we suspect is happening for orangutans is there's actually a lot of fluctuation in how intensely they're relying on their mother's milk. So it's not just sort of a, a straight line once they reach you know, the age of three, they're only nursing 30% of the time or something like that. But it actually seems like it probably tracks variation in food availability. So maybe this period you know, down here, there isn't... Um, you know, there's lots of fruit available, it's amassed, orangutan babies are able to eat and digest things like those squishy fruits that Walima had, you know, four of in her mouth. And then all of a sudden the mast ends and they have to eat bark and, and leaves. And so they start to rely heavily on their mothers for nursing again. So this amount of, or this sort of balance of, of nursing and incorporating solid food and responding to changes in food availability um, is a pretty unique function of orangutans. Um, and we can see this nursing happening for a really long time, um, potentially as long as eight years, right? So there's this really cool paper by Tanya Smith and colleagues that looked at um, isotope signatures of nursing in um, orangutan teeth from some prospective museum specimens. Um, and so you can see there are these fluctuations down at the bottom graph in the amount of kind of what at least the isotopic signature of, of nursing intensity, right? So for eight years, potentially, orangutans are able to fall back on their moms when they're not able to eat the foods that are making up the bulk of the food available in their environment. Um, so this has a couple of interesting consequences. First, compared to other primates that have either a, a pretty short period of growth and development before they start incorporating normal foods or, or solid foods, um, orangutans can really take their time developing ecological competence. Um, it's not entirely clear which comes first, you know, the, the extended life period, life history, or the extended period to develop growth and de um, to develop ecological competence, but what it means. So you have this, this eight year period potentially where if you can't figure out how to eat that bark, it's okay because you can go and nurse. Um, an interesting consequence of orangutan's semi-solitary lifestyle though, is that infants and juveniles don't have any conspecifics to learn from, right? So this young chimpanzee who's learning to, you know, termite fish might be watching her mother termite fish, but she also is probably watching, you know, other adult females and she's seeing different strategies and different techniques from a bunch of different animals. Orangutans really only learn foraging from their mother, maybe from older siblings if their older sisters are still ranging with their mom, but in general, orangutans have many fewer conspecifics to observe foraging. So like I said, there's, this is great for juvenile orangutans in terms of this, this extended developmental period, right? You can always fall back on mom if things don't end up, you know, the environment gets complicated, it's okay. On the other hand, this is a real extended burden for orangutan mothers. Um, and this is probably particularly taxing during low fruit periods when we know that orangutans are taking in fewer calories in general, right? So if you're eating less food, you're taking in um, 
less calories and then you have to start supporting you know your four-year-old who's starting to nurse again um this might be a real constraint during low fruit periods when orangutans are already kind of at a low energy balance um so what this means is that getting offspring to competently eat foods even the ones that are hard to eat um is an important thing for mother orangutans to do. They don't want to have to be sustaining their babies for eight years necessarily. Um, so the question is, how do they do it? Well, feeding transfer intolerance is something that we see across a variety of organisms, right? This is just acquiring food captured or harvested by another individual. Um, it could also be allowing another individual to forage in close proximity, you know, so tolerating somebody sitting and feeding next to you. This is something, like I said, that we see pretty commonly across birds and mammals. Um, you know, this, this penguin is transferring food from um, to its offspring. Um, we see it in two major er, contexts. So there's adult feeding tolerance or food transfer, and then we see kind of parent offspring food transfer or food tolerance. So in an adult context, especially among the primates, food transfer or food sharing is pretty rare. It tends to be predicated by dominance and by group dynamics. Um, sometimes, you know, you can argue that it's a form of reciprocal altruism. So this chimpanzee will share meat with another male in his group. And then in the future, there should be, there's some expectation that the, that male will support them um, in, you know, a, a dispute of some sort or in an aggressive encounter. Um, it can also be considered a least costly strategy. So, you know, there are two individuals foraging. Is it really worth the energy to chase somebody away or do you just tolerate them being there um, and you both feed together? Um, and it's also often a feature of mating and consort ships. And this is especially salient in orangutans um, where the only time that you really see adults spending a lot of time together um, or the, the main time that you see adults spending a lot of time together is when um, there's some sort of long-term mating consortship happening. So they'll, they'll be together for a day or two um, meeting. From a parent offspring perspective, there are two major hypotheses that explain why you might see food transfer. One of them is this nutritional hypothesis. It says that food transfer is a way for offspring to receive nutrients from their parents during the transition to independent foraging. So this is something like you know, adult birds vomiting up their, in their baby's mouths, whatever they've brought back to the nest, right? This sort of nutrition, um, nutritional transfer supports those offspring until they're able to forage for themselves. The informational hypothesis says that food sharing and feeding tolerance is a way for individuals to learn about diet breath and actually learn food processing techniques. So you can, if you tolerate your baby sitting next to you and staring while you are, you know, a capuchin monkey working really hard to crack open an egg, what you're allowing that individual to do is observe how you do things. I'm sorry, I said crack an egg, I meant crack a seed. Um, you're allowing your, you know, your offspring to watch how you, you know, use stones to crack open these seeds, right? So it's a way to transfer skills. So there's been some really fantastic work on orangutan food sharing um, at some other research sites in um, Borneo. So um, Adrian Yegi and some colleagues worked at Tuanan and showed that mother offspring pairs share about 90% of their diets in terms of the, the dietary composition, right? So, so mothers and offspring are eating essentially the same thing. Um, but they observed no actual direct teaching of how to forage. Instead, what they saw was the babies were really intently watching how their mothers were eating food. And then they would beg for food and you know, the mothers would share food with them. Um, they also saw that offspring were tended to solicit the transfer of, of really challenging foods. Um, so, you know, if the mother is eating something that takes a lot of effort or a lot of skill to eat, that's something that babies would start begging for. Um, and mothers would tolerate that sort of food sharing from younger individuals, um, although, and they got kind of less tolerant as babies got older. But this wasn't something that happened. It, there was no relationship between weaning um, and food tolerance, basically, because orangutans are fully weaned at a pretty, you know, 
when they're pretty old, so seven or eight. And presumably by the time you're a seven or eight year old orangutan, you're able to eat a lot of these foods and mothers are much less tolerant of, of this sort of food transfer. Um, so what I wanted to ask is whether orangutan moms at Gunung Palung share and um, tolerate co-feeding of, of challenging foods and as a way to facilitate the development of ecological toler or ecological competence um, among their offspring. So we expect to see, so we predict that mothers are sharing or tolerating co-feeding, especially on those foods that are challenging to process. And that, you know, this is a different relationship than we might see between um, complexity of foods and food sharing among adults, right? So we, because we expect that food sharing between adults and juveniles comes from a different, you know, there's a different reason driving it. We shouldn't see a, the same relationship between food complexity and rates of food sharing or food tolerance between adults and adults and adults and offspring. So these data were at, taken from a, a different data set than the videos. Um, these are data that were collected during full day follows between January 2009 and July 2019. Um, they were collected um, at our field site of Gunung Palung National Park um, during, like I said, these full day follows when people are collecting really detailed data on how um, individuals interact with each other. So what I calculated was the rate of food transfer and feeding tolerance. And here, remember what I said about orangutans being semi-solitary and a party counting as being within 50 meters of each other. So feeding tolerance is just two individuals who are we're feeding in the same tree. Um, it doesn't necessarily imply that they're close together in the tree, but that they're, they're actually in the same tree. Um, so we, in addition to calculating to recording whether we saw food transfer and feeding tolerance, we record the food type that's being eaten. So if it's leaves or fruit or bark um, or termites, we recorded food complexity with a couple of different proxies. So we looked at foods will be eaten more slowly. And we looked at the fruit wet weight, assuming that larger fruits are going to be eaten or larger foods will be eaten more slowly. And it's important to note that these two um, proxies for complexity are, are basically getting at a, a pretty similar thing, basically how big something is. Um, and obviously there's a lot more that goes into complexity, but it's sort of a first stab at understanding the relationship between complexity and food sharing this is how we decided to, to understand or describe foods complexity. So what do we actually see when we look at these rates of food tolerance? So if we compare, um, if we, we look at the rate of food tolerance between adults, we actually in our data set had about 1500 um, observations of females tolerating co-feeding with other adults. So about 20% of these were with other females, about 60% of these were with flanged males, and about 20% of these were with unflanged males. We only saw male-male food tolerance three times um, over this 10-year period. So males really don't tolerate feeding close to each other. What were they feeding on? Well, female, so basically everybody was primarily tolerating um, other individuals in close proximity while they were foraging on fruit. So I should again note, I didn't, you know, control for um, fruit availability. Um, so it's possible that this is just an artifact of what's available in the forest. But because we know that there's so much fluctuation in, in fruit productivity, I suspect that the fact that they're actually um, tolerating feeding on fruit um, at such a high rate compared to other food items is something significant, is something meaningful. If we look at rates of food tolerance between mothers and offspring, um, we had about 1500 observations of mothers tolerating their foods. Um, a little bit more than half of these were feeding um, tolerance from young infants, so individuals under the age of three, um, and a little bit less than half were juveniles, so individuals between the ages of four and eight. And again, what we see is that food tolerance is most common um, while individuals are feeding on fruit. Um, interestingly, you get a little bit more food tolerance than leaves. Again, with these sample sizes, it's hard to say whether this is, um, this doesn't necessarily represent a, a, a real significant pattern that leaves are being um, 
co-feeding is tolerated more while eating the use than eating other things. Um, but we do see some interesting patterns. If we look at actual events of food transfer between adults, we only saw 21 actual transfers of food between females and other adult individuals. Um, so about seven transfers between females and other females, about four between females and unflanged males, I'm sorry, between females and flanged males, and then um, about 10 um, observations of food transfers with uh, females and unflanged males. Um, and what we see here, um, again, we saw no food transfer between adult males. Um, most of the actual food transfer that's happening is while foraging on fruit. Um, females tended to share bark and pith with other females at a much higher rate than other foods. Um, but again, there are only 21 observations here. So it's hard to say whether this is an artifact of sample size or an actual pattern. Um, the point here is that food transfer is pretty rare among adults, um, especially compared to food tolerance. If we look at the relationship between food transfer and food type for mothers and offspring, we had many more relative to the adult observations of food transfer. So about 90% of the observations of mothers transferring food were to infants. Only about 10% of those observations were mothers transferring food to older juveniles. And the vast majority of the foods that were transferred from mother to offspring were fruit, um, with a little bit more food transfer of um, ants and termites, right? Um, but really, mothers and off mothers seem to be transferring fruit primarily to their offspring. So then we wanted to understand the relationship specifically between mother and offspring, um, sort of feeding complexity and, and the role of food tolerance and, and sharing. Um, and so what we see is that um, foods transferred between mothers and offspring are foods that are eaten significantly more slowly than foods that are you know, transferred between adults or where co-feeding is tolerated. So the fruits, the foods that mothers transfer to their offspring are eaten at a rate of about eight a minute, as opposed to foods um, eat, that are sort of where co-feeding is tolerated. Um, and so this is a significant relationship. We see that foods transferred from mother and infant are, are eaten significantly more slowly. If we look specifically at fruit, you can see that foods that are more frequently shared are, um, so the frequency of sharing here is this vertical axis. Vertical axis. Um, the horizontal is sort of the, the feeding rate. And so you can see that foods that are eaten um, at a really, really low rate. So like less than five fruits per minute. It's fruit that takes a long time to process um, or fruits that are potentially really large. Those are fruits that tend to be shared pretty frequently compared to fruits that are eaten, you know, 20 a minute. They don't really share those with their offspring. And again, if we look at, you know, complexity in a slightly different way, looking at weight, um, what we see is that fruits transferred between mothers and infants are significantly heavier. Um, so in terms of the mean weight in grams is the axis, the vertical axis here. And so you can see that fruits transferred are significantly heavier as opposed to fruits that are tolerated or that adults, you know, have any sort of co-feeding or, or sharing relationship. Um, and again, if we look at sort of the frequency, um, the, so we have the frequency of, fruit, frequency of food sharing, again, on the vertical axis and um, fruit weight on the horizontal axis. And you can see that fruits that are shared really frequently tend to be those heavier fruits. Um, and finally, we wanted to look at the relationship between fruit sharing and total non-structural carbohydrates. Um, so those are gonna be things that are, you know, complicated or challenging to process, challenging to digest, especially things like um, fibers and, um, you know, just things that are difficult to digest compared to um, you know, water soluble carbohydrates and things like that. So if you look at the proportion of total non-structural carbohydrates in um, foods that are shared by, off by mothers to offspring, there is again, a higher rate of food sharing 
um, for foods that have more non-structural carbohydrates. So this suggests that foods that are more challenging to process, foods that take longer to eat, foods that are heavier, foods that maybe take more effort to actually physically break down while you're digesting, those are fruits that tend to be shared more frequently between mothers and offspring. So we can say that adult adult pairs transfer different kinds and qualities of foods than mother offspring pairs, which suggests that there, there's something going on unique about mother offspring food transfer. We see a significant correlation between the rate of food sharing and the consumption of large, slowly eaten fruits that are high in non-structural carbohydrates, right? So mothers are more likely to share fruit that are large, that are slowly eaten and high in non-structural carbohydrates than smaller, easier to process, quicker to eat fruits. Um, so what this all suggests is that mothers are actually transferring more complex foods to their offspring. Um, and so in this case, it looks like this sort of food transfer actually facilitates knowledge transfer, just like we saw um, with, with, you know, Yegi and colleagues hypothesis, right? This, the role of food transfer is to facilitate knowledge transfer and to help individuals develop ecological competence. It's not really transferring important nutrition. It's not, you know, supplementing them um, because it doesn't happen at a really high rate, this sort of food transfer. But what it allows is this development of ecological competence as babies observe their mothers processing foods and are sometimes given foods by their mother. So I think this is, is kind of evidence that pushes towards the conclusion that this extended life history allows individual baby orangutans to slowly develop their ecological competence in terms of, of learning to forage like an adult. And for an animal that lives through these, you know, ex extreme periods of low food availability, you need a lot of time to be able to observe your mother eating these, you know, crazy fruits crazy foods like bark or pith or termite mounds and things like that and able to become a competent adult who can you know, forage and survive and reproduce in these really unpredictable environments. So this is obviously just sort of a, a, a series of first steps. So there are some exciting things that can come next. Um, always looking for more complete larger data sets. So we need to do things like controlling for food availability and dietary proportions when we're examining the rate of food transfer and things like that. And expand sample sizes, especially for understanding how orangutans are processing foods. Um, so I'm excited to you know, be able to pull a larger data set together to kind of get a better, clearer picture of what's happening. Um, and there, there's more than just observing food or chewing food that goes into ecological competence, right? So of course, I, I, like I said, I wanna collect more data on chewing, um, but we also wanna understand how actually efficient orangutans are at digesting. So there are some cool ways to get at actual digestive efficiency, looking at things like the amount of fiber that's in their diet relative to the amount of fiber that's in feces. Um, you can also look at things like fecal particle size. Um, so how small are actual pieces of food being broken down during chewing and then during the digestive process? So these are all things that I'm excited to do once, hopefully someday soon, labs open back up and we're able to you know, travel and, and conduct research in, in um, an easier, less pandemic-y world. Um, also, orangutans use tools. Um, and so understanding how you know, babies learn this tool use, I think, and kind of the, the cultural learning is gonna be an exciting piece of ecological competence. Um, the other kind of side of this is that mothers have, um, you know, mothers expend a lot of energy on lactation, right? And so understanding the relationship between lactation and the development of ecological competence is something that I'm excited about. How are females maintaining their energy balance? Um, we can actually use fecal isotopes to sort of track weaning. Um, and so we might be able to see in a wild population before you know they die and you can look at their the barium in their teeth to use isotopes to track the frequency and intensity of nursing. Um, 
in the meantime, one of the things that I have my army of undergrads is working on is actually watching video of orangutans nursing and counting the number of sucks while they're nursing. So we're starting to get a picture of nursing rates um, and nursing intensity for orangutans of different ages. Um, and before I close, I just want to point out that this is actually, you know, we sometimes think of conservation and basic research as being two, you know, separate things. But actually, I think this sort of basic research question does have a lot of conservation relevance. And this is important because orangutans are critically endangered across their range. Populations are decreasing um, and habitat loss is really, really um, a significant um, driver of this sort of endangerment of wild orangutans, right? So understanding what makes orangutans have this extended life history and this really slow rate of reproduction will, for one thing, help us understand why orangutans are in such you know, dire straits in terms of their numbers, right? If you grow and reproduce so slowly, you only have a baby every eight years, um, and you know you have habitat loss and things like that, it's going to cause pretty significant problems if you're trying to keep a population alive. So understanding exactly why orangutans have this extended life history will maybe help us plan you know, management strategies for conserving environments and things like that. Um, but also understanding the ways that orangutans develop ecological con competence is particularly relevant because there are lots of orangutans um, that are rescued or confiscated from illegal pet trades. And then these guys are brought to um, orangutan rehabilitation centers and they need to be taught how to be competent adult orangutans so that they can eventually be re-released and they won't starve to death when you know it's not a masting period and they're supposed to be eating pith right so we need to understand how orangutans develop ecological competence so we can supplement um, especially these rehabilitated orangutans these rehabilitants um, as they're re released into the wild so all in all, oh, and yes, of course, habitat loss and sort of shifting um, ranging patterns might mean that orangutans are coping with new foods as they're moving into more anthropogenic environments. And so these might actually cause new challenges for survival and um, you know feeding and things like that. So understanding how orangutans learn how to eat foods is of particular importance. And with that, let me say thank you so much um, to my, my supervisor, um, Tim Lehman took many of the pictures that were in this and why you Susanto is our main guy in Indonesia, all of our funders um, and the Indonesian permitting and granting agencies and the amazing field assistants, project managers, researchers of um, the orangutan project and my wonderful team of undergrads who are counting orangutan shoes. Um, so thanks to all of them. And thank you so much to all of you both for inviting me to talk and spending your uh, evening or morning or afternoon, depending on where you are, listening to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Kane. It was an uh, amazing talk, I would say. Um, many of us are actually very interested in orangutans, and we see how uh, they have been facing a lot of conservation problems over the year with palm oils and a lot of habitat degradation. So mm -hmm. it becomes a very important topic around this time that uh, because as you said that the infants take so much time uh, to get weaned from the mother, it becomes really important when it comes to the habitat degradation and certain things like that. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Dr. Kane, for enlightening us with the with many of the things which, uh, I mean, most of the things which we, were, we did not know about. So, okay, so would you like to take a break and uh, we can ask questions or you're okay with it taking now? Yeah, we can. Go ahead and ask some questions if you don't mind me drinking while we're. Of course. Um, so the first question is from Samrat. He asks, what is the reason for you to collect data on oral processing and uh, food type? Yeah, so when I was thinking about oral processing behavior, I want to understand generally how different foods are being eaten. So in an ideal world, you would look at how each individual species of food, so each individual fruit species or leaf species is processed. Um, and that helps us understand, you know, when Wolubia is available, you know, orangutans chew this much. And when Tetramystera is available, orangutans chew a little bit less. And so maybe um, these periods when they're relying on Wolubia 
are actually more energetically intensive or require more effort while processing, right? We're not quite there yet. So what I've done instead is pool things by food type. So we look at fruit um, as a general category, or we look at leaves as a general category. So we want to understand how much effort goes into processing these different foods because you know, as I said, there are, there are foods that take more or less effort to process. And so those are going to probably pose different kinds of challenges while orangutans are consuming them. They might require different amounts of energy. Um, so looking at different food type is just sort of a one step more general um, that lets us start to think about the amount of effort that orangutans put in to eating their food, to actually processing their food when there's lots of fruit available during these masting periods or when there isn't a lot of fruit available and they're eating, you know, mostly termite or bark or something like that. All right, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Second question is from Ra. He asks, uh, surely the ju juveniles also have milk, milk teeth like human children. So do the juveniles sampled here have milk teeth? Yeah, almost certainly. And so that's one reason that we suspect that juveniles aren't going to be quite as good at adults as processing some of these more challenging foods because they've got smaller teeth, the teeth aren't necessarily permanent. Um, and so, yeah, so orangutans like humans, like other primates have, um, you know, milk teeth and uh, you lose your deciduous teeth and new ones grow in. And that's an additional wrinkle in terms of how baby orangutans are processing foods, right? If you lose your incisors because your adult incisors are coming in, you know, what are you supposed to do for that period? Um, we didn't really um, characterize kind of dental development um, because it's hard to see the actual teeth sometimes, but there's been some cool work, especially with chimps, looking at age based on pictures of the, um, when they have open mouths and you can kind of see dental development. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be an additional wrinkle in how they're processing foods. All right, uh, so Mohan asks whether, do you consider snakes also as a predator? Oh, that's a good question. So snakes can definitely kill orangutans, but to my, you know, the, you know, I think a, a cobra bite or something like that would not be great. Um, but to my knowledge, there are not very many opportunities for sort of um, predating snakes to interact with orangutans because orangutans are almost exclusively up in the canopy. And as far as I know, most of the snakes on Borneo and Sumatra are terrestrial. Um, so there are not many snakes that are going to be actively looking for orangutan prey. I would guess that if a snake bites an orangutan, you know, that would be like a in defense or something like that, but they're not, they're not a predator in the way that like, you know, eagles will predate on monkeys or something like that, where that's an important food source. Um, so I think it's pretty rare that, that orangutans are killed by snake bites. Okay, wonderful. Another question. So are there, are these two male moths, which the orangutans have, are they fixed for life? So they do not seem to be. This is something okay. that um, is still the mechanisms determining um, these two morphs are really unclear because we just, you know, thinking about these long lifespans and these long periods of growth and development, it's rare, you know, we just don't have a lot of animals that we've seen kind of their, their full lifespan. Um, but what it looks like is, so unflanged males can become flanged males. Flanged males don't go back to being unflanged males. Although you might imagine being this, this large male with those cheek pads and they have all sorts of extra fur, they, that's really energetically expensive. And so there's a period at which they stop being quite so impressive. They're sort of past prime, um, but they don't go back to being unflanged. They maintain their flanges until they die. Um, so flanged males can become, I'm sorry, unflanged males can become flanged males, but they don't necessarily. And we don't know what drives that transition. And we don't know what determines whether or not one male will become flanged versus unflanged. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. And I think one of the cool things about studying orangutans, because they have such a long lifespan, there are all sorts of these, you know, pretty basic questions or you know, obvious quest fundamental questions, I guess I should say, that we just don't know the answer to yet because we just, they live too long. It's really cool.
Okay, Partha's uh, power is gone yet again. Oh no! So let me take it uh, from here. <laughs> Sounds uh, good. Right. So uh, I'll just uh, uh, paraphrase Arjit Pal's question. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arjit asks, uh, "What is the difference of processing uh, foods versus uh, or like fruits, uh, which needs some processing effort between adult and juveniles?" in context of choice success and time spent so what is basically the difference uh, in processing them um so like what what does it mean for for their um their effort and things like that uh uh like do they choose to process some food or mm. and does the success depend on that yeah so i think there there are definitely foods that like adult males can eat easily that other individuals can't eat easily. So because they're so much larger and they're able to exert more force, they can do things like crack open durian with their jaws really easily. So there are definitely differences, you know, there are some foods that I think adult males can eat that are harder or tougher or more challenging that aren't accessible for non-flanged, you know, males or for adult females. Um, so I think in general, animals pre- prefer to eat foods that are easier to eat. Um, they prefer to eat foods that tend to be, you know, more calorie dense or higher in sugar content, um, maybe have other nutritional content that's important. Um, but what, so I don't know that um, oral processing is nece- necessarily a function of choice and that they'll, they prefer to eat, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, so I think given the opportunity, given a, you know, a buffet, orangutans would prefer to eat foods that require less oral processing, foods that are easier to eat. Um, but sometimes that's just not available in their environment, right? So I think um, food choice is really complicated and it's driven by a bunch of different things. Oral processing and sort of the mechanical protections of the food are just one in kind of a a panoply of reasons why an individual might choose to eat a food. Um, But when we think about kind of you, you ask about kind of trade-offs between processing effort and and food availability and things like that. I think it's an important piece of that puzzle if we want to understand why orangutans or, or primates in general are choosing to eat the foods that they do. We need to understand um, how they eat them and, and what costs eating them might impose. Okay, so in a related uh, question, mm-hmm. uh, I wanted to ask like uh, in the graph that you showed, you showed that fruit uh, is more transferred, the most transferred uh, food mm-hmm. item, right? Mm-hmm. So is it more challenging than bark? Uh, so is that the reason why bark is you know quite low? Because I expect bark to be harder and more challenging. So why is that? I think so. I was I found that's pretty surprising. Also, um, I think part of it is that um, when mothers are eating a lot of bark, that's probably a time when juveniles are nursing more intensely. Um, so I think I would guess, and this is based on my um, this is a an educated guess, not a, you know, based on data, but I suspect that um, orangutan babies are spending more time observing um, bark than having bark, you know, handed to them. Because basically the way that the orangutans eat bark, they they basically bite the side of the tree trunk and then kind of pull it off. Um, and then they sort of scrape off the inside of the bark with their incisors. Um, and I think that's probably something that's just physically hard <laughs> to, pro- to, to give to your offspring, right? Um, so that might be a case where actually observation is more important than food transfer. Um, whereas when you're eating fruits and things like that, those are, th- are foods that you can actually, you know, masticate and process and, and give to your baby, or you can, um, you know, you take a, you pick a couple of fruits and the baby can snag one from your hand while you're feeding. So I don't necessarily think that if we compare, you know, if you look across foods that are all, you know, more or less challenging, that what's being transferred is going to be a direct correlation between food complexity or um, kind of the complexity of oral processing. But I think if we look within fruit as a food type, the more complicated ones are going to be the ones that orangutans are, are transferring between mothers and offspring more frequently. 
yeah yeah this is a graph also showed that the mm -hmm. the next one uh, so arijit uh, in connection to that he asked like uh, is quite uh, similar to what you just said so why mm -hmm. do you think the mother of spring food sharing is more for the need uh, more for uh, foods that require a lot of processing effort is it about giving exposure to learn how to process these difficult uh, questions because you said it's about uh, knowledge transfer right it's not mm -hmm. necessarily so uh, why do you think it's just uh, the food that require a lot of processing power that you know uh, needs to be learned yeah so i think it's exactly that that you need lots of opportunities to to practice opening a fruit or to practice eating you know one of these large fruits um and so i suspect that it is an ability an opportunity for for individuals or for mothers to give their babies exposure to to be able to start practicing oral processing i think in a lot of cases also we see that mothers are starting to open so babies will like actively grab food from their mother's mouth sometimes and orangutan moms can be pretty tolerant. So they'll actually let them take some of these foods that are partially chewed, right? So it, in some cases they might get things started for the baby. So it's a, a way to sort of develop this ability to process those difficult foods. So just include opening, how to open uh, a durian, for example? Yeah, I've never seen food transfer between, um, of like an actual whole durian um, between mothers and babies. But yeah, in terms of like, opening the durian and then the baby can take a seed or something like that. All that right. might All be right. a good example. All right. So I had a question. So mm -hmm. given that the hypothesis is that this is knowledge transfer, uh, mm -hmm. do you expect to find cultural differences in food transfer patterns between different orangutan populations? And have you already observed such a thing? Yeah, I would not, that would, I would not be surprised if there were cultural differences in food transfer. Um, it's hard to tease apart what's a cultural difference and what's just related to the, the local ecology. Um, I haven't looked at this a whole lot, I, or I really haven't compared with other um, sites in terms of kind of the foods that are being transferred or how exactly transfer is happening. Um, but I think that's a really exciting question to ask. We know that there are cultural differences between orangutan populations in terms of things like tool use, and even in terms of the, the sorts of foods that they kind of target for tool using. So I'm sure that there are going to be cultural differences in this sort of observational learning as well. Okay, thanks. So Ritwik Banerjee asks, do orangutans have precision grip? And are there any evidence for nutcracking behavior among them similar to chimpanzees? He also asked if uh, you could tell us any simple examples of tool usage by orangutans. Yeah, um, so to my knowledge, so orangutans definitely have precision grip. They, they have very, very dexterous fingers. Um, and you, it's amazing sometimes you can see these, these huge animals, um, you know, using a, a really delicate grasp to get, you know, a really small fruit. Um, I don't know that there's any evidence of nut cracking in um, the wild. And I think part of that is because orangutans, unlike the other great apes, spend most of their time in the trees. So they're not, you know, chimpanzees in like the Thai forest will find these big anvil stones and they spend lots of time on the ground with, with rocks or with sticks cracking open seeds. And we don't see that sort of thing with orangutans because they're almost always up in the tree. Um, I'm not sure it's possible that in captivity as part of, you know, zoos enrichment and things like that, there are some orangutans that have been given access to, to nut cracking and things, but I don't know of any off the top of my head. Um, so the sorts of tools that we see orangutans using, so orangutans build, um, we see so there are some cases where people have seen orangutans using sticks to like test the depth of water that they might be crossing. Um, a lot of the really interesting cultural behavior that we see with orangutans is related to the ways that they build their nests. So it, there are different kinds of nests. You, you, so orangs build nests to sleep in every night. Um, and sometimes you'll see them putting like a pillow of leaves. Um, they don't always put pillows of leaves, you know, not every individual does. So this is something that we think is cultural. Um, they use big piles of leaf or big like leaf covered um, branches as umbrellas when it starts raining really hard. Um, I'm having a hard time thinking. Uh, I know that there is tool use um, while eating um, a fruit called nesia, but I'm not totally sure of the details of how, how that tool use happens. Um, but a lot of the, the cultural differences that we see between orangutan populations are related to sort of these unique ways that they use their environment to either 
make their lives more comfortable. So, you know, hiding under, um, actually breaking off branches and using it as an umbrella or, or making sort of elaborate nests with, with like almost roofs and things like that. Um, so it's a little bit less practical maybe <laughs> than chimpanzee tool use. Um, but it's still, um, it's interesting to see these sort of shared learned behaviors. And as I think somebody had asked or somebody pointed out, you see these um, because mother and offspring orangutan have so much time together. This is a really great opportunity for the sort of social learning that drives cultural innovation and cultural development, right? Um, so you have this really extended period of time where orangutan babies can really focus on what their mothers are doing and start to sort of develop some of these same strategies for existing in their environments. All right. Uh, so a slightly tangential question and mm -hmm. maybe a little depressing, but I think this should be asked. So uh, Nadira asks, is there any difference between development of orangutans that grew up in the wild versus mm -hmm. ones that grew up in rehabilitation centers? Because those in the rehabilitation centers are taught by humans. So there's no knowledge transfer there. So yeah. It. Yeah, so there are definitely um, pretty significant differences in um, kind of rehabilitant orangutan competence at dealing with their ecological environment and wild orangutan competence. Um, a lot of rehabilitant orangutans are not released back to sort of like a fully wild context. So they're sort of, they're still provisioned um, to make sure that they're able to get their full um, you know, caloric intake and things like that. Um, there are a number of other sort of developmental consequences, and it's hard to say how much of that is a result of, you know, growing up in a rehabilitation center um, versus the wild, and how much of it is a function of, you know, being traumatized when they're captured for the pet trade. So usually these um, rehabilitant orangutans are orphans whose mothers were killed and then they were sold as pets and then they were confiscated. And so it's it's probably quite traumatic for the, the rehabilitant orangutans. And then they're living in a really, as, um, as Nadira notes, a really sort of artificial environment. And so, yeah, of course they're going to be consequences. And I think um, a lot of rehabilitant orangutans remain at least in part reliant on those rehabilitation centers, even if they're sort of semi free ranging, I think they do come back and, and rely on on those sorts of foods. Um, but I, I haven't really had the opportunity to work at all, or to work much with the rehabilitation centers. So I think it's interesting that that, that might be an opportunity, like I said, for for sort of melding the sort of basic research questions with sort of conservation relevant outcomes. All right. So we have a lot of other questions coming in. I hope you mm -hmm. have the time to address all of them. Uh, yep, I'm around. <laughs> right. So uh, I will be skipping a few questions that have been already asked. So sure. um, a lot of questions from YouTube. Uh, so Arijit asks, like, does uh, food sharing is food sharing some kind of strategy embedded in, in orangutan society, which may increase ecological competence? along with assessing the uh, energy rich resource. So is it uh, embedded in the, is it uh, crucial for orangutans <laughs> to have this uh, trait? Yeah, I, th I think I think it is um, really crucial for, for young orangutans to be able to share food with their mothers. And I think this is something that we see across a whole bunch of different you know, not just primates, not just great apes, but we see this around so many taxes that I think it really is something kind of fundamental to growing up, right? Part of your, your period of growth and development is developing the ability to, to move through your environment and support yourself as a full grown adult. And so I think food sharing is going to have to be part of that um, for orangutans and probably for a lot of other organisms as well. All right. So before we go to the other questions, uh, there are a lot of compliments coming from a lot of people. Just read out a few comments. Oh. Uh, Alex Goya, thanks you a lot for the talk. It was super right. interesting. Uh, Hilal Jyoti Singha says, thanks for sharing the knowledge. Like maybe orangutans were sharing their uh, food. <laughs> sharing knowledge. So this is also Hopefully kind of this was easier to process than. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> so, and Francis May Tenorio uh, says, awesome talk, Dr. Erin. Oh, thank you. Uh, going back to the questions, uh, Shraman yeah. Dasgupta, uh, mm -hmm. back to ecology. He All asked, right. is there any change in food sharing and weaning time? 
and also food processing time between less and more disturbed uh, forest areas and also any variation over the course of a year seasonal variations yeah so i um don't actually know whether or not we see so i have not really worked in truly anthropogenic areas to get this sort of information um it's these are contexts where it's often hard to habituate orangutans in, in these sort of areas with high levels of anthropogenic disturbance because um, those are often areas where you have high levels of human orangutan conflict and maybe poaching or, or um, you know, things like that. So um, I would suspect that more disturbed areas, um, if they have then less sort of ripe fruit availability, you might see more food sharing. Um, in some cases, the, the sorts of invasive species that come um, from high levels of ecological disturbance are actually easier to process than sort of wildly or naturally occurring foods. And in some cases, they actually um, are much more predictable in their availability. So um, I think it's at Chuanan, there's, a, there's one really invasive um, like shrub, I think, that provides a lot of fruit and that's something that the orangutans eat a lot of and so there it's actually potentially easier for them to make up their caloric intake in this sort of um you know in these more disturbed areas potentially um one thing that i'm excited about so our research project is starting to to do some more work in a part of the national park that has a longer history of disturbance and logging and things like that so i can't give you a really um a clear and definite answer to that question yet, but that's an interesting question and one that hopefully in the coming years we'll be able to answer. Um, in terms of interannual variation or seasonal variation in um, food sharing and weaning time, so because the forests aren't necessarily tied to a, a sort of annual fruiting cycle, um, we don't necessarily see things like food sharing happening in sort of an annual or seasonal cycle either. I think those tend to be more tied to periods of masting. Um, and so that's one thing that makes studying orangutans kind of challenging is that you can't just be there for a year and get a full picture of sort of what an annual seasonal cycle looks like. That doesn't tell you enough about the full range of variability within an environment. Um, so what we see the sort of variation is over sort of the full range of fruit productivity. Um, which takes usually a lot more than a year. Um, so that's, I think, where we really see that variation. Okay, so uh, Saurabh Marthi asks uh, two questions. The first mm -hmm. is, uh, is the fruiting period unpredictable? Uh, the second, uh, let's ask the question, or maybe you can answer this and then ask the second question. Yeah, so yeah, the fruiting period is unpredictable because of that mast pattern that characterizes dipter carp trees. So basically, the the trees will produce fruit and because it's tied to these larger el nino cycles which really don't they're not um you know you can't predict when the next mast period will be um so it's just a function of the sort of ecological context in which orangutans live and the weather patterns and things like that um that we they really have no predictability to it um so the forests look really, really different during mast and non-masting periods. It's, it's really dramatically different how much fruit is and isn't available. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's really strange. My, my dissertation work was in a forest that has a pretty predictable, you know, rainy season, wet, or wet season, dry season, wet season, dry season, you know when it'll fruit, you know, you know what month different trees will produce fruit. In. And so that was what I was really used to. That's and, uh, in the Diana monkey. Yeah, so in, in West Africa. Um, and so going to a forest where there's no rhyme or reason to when a, when there's fruit, it's really strange, but it's a really exciting wrinkle um, for the ecology of that forest, right? It's a really interesting constraint that it puts on the ecology of the animals that live there. So it makes it a really great system to ask questions about how animals cope with unpredictability and how they cope with, you know, how do you grow and develop when you have no guarantee that there will be, you know, stuff that you can eat next month, right? It's an exciting place to, to do this sort of research. All right. 
So Saurabh's second question, I think, comes mm -hmm. from a conservation perspective. So he asks uh, if uh, artificial supplements, that is providing fruits during fruitless periods, will it be harmful or will it be a good approach? I think it's probably more likely to be harmful. Um, the orangutans are really well adapted to this sort of environment that they live in. Um, you know, they, they might go into, you know, periods of negative energy balance when fruit is less available, but orangutans, um, you know, orangutans do really, really well in forests when they're left alone to do sort of their own thing. Um, there is a, a really interesting paper um, by Maria Van Nordick and some other um, orangutan specialists a few years back that looked at infant mortality and sort of demographics. And basically what they showed is that infant mortality for orangutans at the places where people have done research on wild orangutans is comparable to infant mortality in Switzerland, essentially, right? So babies, even if they have a hard time, even if it's a stressful environment, babies are adapted to survive these periods of really low fruit availability. Um, so the issue here is not that orangutans are doing poorly in their environment. It's that anthropogenic encroachment and climate change are changing the environments that orangutans have developed in. So I think the, the impulse to maybe provide fruit during fruitless periods makes sense. But what we see is that, that so I suspect that that would actually increase a lot, um, increase social contact between orangutans. It might increase actual competition between orangutans because you have a, a scarce resource um, that might act to pull animals that would otherwise be pretty solitary um, together. And so that might bring, you know, disease transmission at higher rates. It might bring actual physical competition and fighting and things like that. Um, so for orangutans that are in wild, you know, in forests, I think just letting them do their orangutan thing is, is the best strategy. And so where we should, where the, those sorts of efforts are, are best devoted to sort of protecting and preserving the habitat that orangutans are currently in. All right. Uh, Joydeep Sheel has a few questions. He asks yeah. uh, how the nutritional regime of food affects the lactation period in mothers. And if there is a prolonged lactation period, how does the mother compensate the energy requirement? Yeah, so what we see is that during periods when there's lots of fruit available in the environment, ad adult orangutans eat huge excesses of calories. And during these periods, they build up their fat stores, basically. And then during lean periods, when the, you know, it's not amassed, they, they essentially, you know, they, they eat what calories they can, but they, they make up the rest of it off of their fat stores. Um, and so, so mothers seem to be compensating for this, um, you know, intensive lactation during low fruit availability by eating lots and lots of food when it's available and then having fat stores available to, to support themselves. Um, but I think there's also sort of evolutionarily, there's going to be kind of a, a trade-off, right, between mothers wanting to maintain their own body condition to be able to get pregnant and have more babies um, and wanting to make sure that they provide enough energy via lactation for their offspring to survive. Um, so I think that's, that's a, a trade-off that, that probably individual orangutans physiology is, is making for them. Um, but yeah, the, the period of lactation, I think, um, is certainly going to be, you know, how intensely um, juveniles are relying on their mothers to supplement their solid food with, with lactation. That's going to be driven by sort of variation in local ecology. Okay. So in a related question, uh, Sharmista asks, uh, apart from mother-infant food sharing, have you observed any kind of food sharing between father and infant? Uh, so how invested are the fathers are uh, in raising up the infants? Uh, are they invested at all? Yeah, not really. Um, so there is very little interaction between mothers with offspring and adult males. I think it's unlikely that adult males know that they have offspring. Um, there's certainly no parental care. Um, and because they're semi-solitary, I think it's pretty, um, I would suspect they don't spend very much time at all, but with 
mothers with young infants interacting with adult males who may have been the father. Um, we know that infanticide is a risk. Um, and so mother adult females are actually pretty wary of interacting with adult males. Those flanged males that I mentioned, they make really loud, long calls that are, you can hear them for, you know, a, a kilometer or so in the forest and adult females will move away from those and they behave in ways that really suggest they want to avoid adult males, um, especially when they have offspring. So I've, I don't think that there really are opportunities, unfortunately, for adult males to invest in kind of infants or even have, you know, get close enough to, to tolerate co-feeding, never mind food sharing. So yeah, it's really based on, on mothers and their offspring. But there are cases of infanticides in orangutans uh, you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. so how, mm -hmm. how, do, how do the males actually recognize if an infant is theirs or not? So I don't think that the infanticide necessarily is driven by um, paternity. Yeah, it's it's a it's complicated because the yeah I don't think that the males Wouldn't do that recognize. Would that be counterproductive actually? Ecological it doesn't make an evolutionary sense, right? Well, so for males, right? The, I guess the the evolutionary, or you know the the ultimate point of infanticide potentially is that um, if an infant if a female is nursing, then she's not cycling. Um, and so if a male kills an infant, then the female would resume estrus cycles and potentially the male could mate with her and then she would become pregnant potentially. Um, and so I think, so I would suspect that because there, there are so many males in a population, there are so many females in a population, it's pretty, un, it's, infanticide is rare. And I think the chances that a male would accidentally kill and offspring are probably lower than the prospect of killing an infant, bringing a female it back into estrus, and then being yeah. able to reproduce would yeah, be. That, that makes sense. Uh, uh, Deepanvita Purohit asks, uh, if you have seen orangutans foraging in the night. Ooh, I never have. Um, Usually when we do full day follows, we try to get out to, so we leave camp between like usually around four in the morning, get out to their nest around five, and then spend the day with them until they build their night nest. So maybe six o'clock at night, seven o'clock at night. And so we usually leave um, right around when it gets dark. Um, but what happens sometimes is we get to the nest the next morning. We know they built their nest. We saw them go to sleep and they're not in the nest. So we know that occasionally they're moving through the forest at night. Um, so believe it or not, orangutans are actually really hard to find and really hard to follow if you can't see them. They're very, very quiet. They don't make any sort of, except for the males long calling, you know, you're not in a group. So it's not like they're contact calling or something like that. Um, you really, if you can't see them, you follow them by hearing sort of the sound of them moving through the, um, the leaves, or you can find them sometimes because they're dropping food while they're foraging. Um, and so <laughs> it would be really cool to see what they were up to at night, because I'm sure they're doing something. Um, but I think right now with our technological limitations of like human eyes, <laughs> it's just not possible. Um, there are some really cool things that are being done with drones and especially with thermal drone cameras where you can actually like follow heat signals and stuff. And so I think that might be a good way that we could start to understand what orangutans are doing at night and maybe they are foraging. Almost certainly juveniles are nursing at night because they, off they usually share nests with their mothers until they're, um, you know, eight or nine years old. Um, but yeah, what they do at night is a total mystery. Okay, so there are just a few more questions. Uh, sure. Take me five more minutes of your time. Yeah, of course. Uh, so Anmol asks, uh, while observing feeding and food processing techniques, do you see unique personalities or individual adaptive strategies emerging in these great apes? Yeah, I mean, I think there are definitely individuals who have strategies and, and individuals certainly have personalities. Um, there are, you know, I really enjoy, you can see sometimes the babies get bored. Their moms will like take a nap and the babies start like hanging off of their foot <laughs> um, or, you know, just like rolling around on the tree branch. You can see the babies are like ready to move on and the moms are either napping or still foraging. 
Um, and you can, there are moms who have varying degrees of tolerance for their babies. Um, you know, so there are some moms who are really, you know, get fed up with the babies climbing around. Like they're, you know, they have, a, they have personalities and things like that. I don't think that I've personally done enough observation to be able to, to tell apart different individual techniques and strategies for feeding. But I, I certainly believe that in different individuals do have different strategies. So before going to the next question, I was just curious when I uh, heard your answer to this question. Do you yeah. uh, give these orangutans names like Jane Goodall used to do with the chimpanzees? <laughs> yeah, they do all have names. Um, you have and, a um, my f So my favorite orangutan name, there's an orangutan, an unflanged male, whose name is Mr. Kachil, which means like Mr. Small in Bahasa. And he's like a, a little unflanged male and he wanders around and does his thing. So that's my personal favorite orangutan name. Um, but there, there are some individuals who we know really, really well, who we've been following since they were infants. So Walima, it, um, the, the orangutan who had all those fruit in her mouth, um, that's somebody who people have been studying since I think 1996. Um, yeah. So right around when she was born. And there are celebrity orangutans also. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Partha has a few questions. Uh, yeah. I just put to you one after the other. Okay. Uh, are there aggressive encounters between mothers and infants? I think aggression is overstating it. Um, you'll see mothers who are more and less tolerant of babies begging for food. Um, so, you know, sometimes mothers will vocalize or will like push the babies away more or less roughly um but you know i don't think i've ever seen like a mother biting the baby sometimes you can see babies get frustrated um and they like whine and they beg in a way that like toddler humans do um but i don't think it really rises to the level of aggression at least not that i've observed uh so I think in, uh, he's also asking if you have seen any difference in aggressive encounters uh with respect to fruiting years and uh, forests of different quality with respect to fruit availability? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't have much experience beyond Gunung Palung, um, but so I think that where rather than um, sort of differences based on ecology, where you see differences in tolerance between mothers and offspring is in the individual's age. So mothers are much more tolerant of really small babies stealing food or trying to steal food than they are of older babies. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's, it maybe is less about the, the local ecology and more about how old the baby is. Oh, great. So that's all the questions that we have. You, uh, there are a few more comments. Uh, Ritwik Banerjee says, thank you, Dr. Kane, for such an insightful talk. Uh, Sarmista, thanks you for answering all the questions. <laughs> sure. uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, Nadira says, thank you so much, Dr. Kane, and everyone who made this presentation happen. It was very insightful. Looking forward to many more interesting topics. Yeah, so with this, I'll uh, uh, hand it over to Partha. Uh, I guess, uh, Partha, right. can you unmute? Yeah, 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 I'm here. Right. Thank you, Ram. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kane. It was really a very engaging session. I would say uh, the question answer almost went as long as the actual talk <laughs> did. So uh, you can see that people are really interested in your work and you would like to keep following what you do. And I'm sure we can perhaps follow you uh, not on your research gate, but on various uh, interesting platforms as well. Yeah, and yeah, I would love that. That would be that would be great. And thank you for introducing us to the amazing. Uh, I, I forgot the name of Mr. Uh, Mr. Kachil. Mr. Kachil. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that. And it was really interesting to have you and have so much of time. That you ha you could give us so much time. That was really wonderful. Oh, and thank you guys so much for inviting me to speak. It was really an honor and I'm, I'm so excited to have been able to participate. So the pleasure is all ours. I mean, we can, we will, we, may, we might ask you again with the amazing response that we got. <laughs> <laughs> it would be great for our TRP as well. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people are thanking you again. And we would like to conclude saying that thank you on behalf of uh, AIP Association. When we started this out, we thought, okay, Maybe we should talk to other scientists or students who are still working on the field and a lot of exciting work is going on. I 
the idea was to have more collaborations not only within the countries but when it's about uh, primates what is what is country anyway so yeah i mean we could uh, do that sometime later again we to have you and maybe know more about your work in the when you are having a little more data more interesting things and also to inform you and everyone else who is tuning into our aip twitter youtube wherever we have few more talks lined up and on 14th like day after tomorrow we have mm -hmm. dr anindya sinha who has been working on bonnet macaques for uh, for more than two decades now oh, wow. is going to uh, talk about social cognition in bonnet macaques yes. do not forget to uh, tune in and listen to the amazing talk it will be as good and uh, as today's and i would like to thank you again dr kane to enlighten us about orangutans and what they are doing with the food and the babies again thank you so much and thank you again uh, to all the participants who gave us so much of their time to listen to an amazing talk and thank you again and thank you to all the people who organized this uh, the tech behind and there is so much there are, there are so many things that goes beyond it i mean more, many of us are in the field uh, with really bad network and <laughs> but but we are getting there i mean we are we are sure we will be getting better with great talks like this so once again thank you so much all of you and we'll see you soon i hope and have a great